Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, the Bible character for the night, as we have shared about a dozen of them now, is the rich farmer. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God kind of reminds me of the story of uh, one day this man was talking to an angel. And the angel says, what can I do for you? And the man says, show me the Wall Street Journal exactly one year ahead of this day that we're in. And this way, I will know where to invest and become very wealthy. And in a flash, just like that, the angel uh, brought about what the man asked for. And he's flipping the pages of the newspaper like a, like a kid at Christmas opening his Christmas presents. He's excited, got a smile on his face. And he's observing uh, which stocks are going to be high and which stocks are going to be low. And then all of a sudden he turns another page and a frown comes over his face. He sees a picture of himself, and it's under the obituary column. (laughs) You know, this life has only so much to offer. And if the life that we live now, we don't live in light of eternity... We're going to waste our time focusing on too many things on this earth. Let us enjoy our lives, but let us as children of God focus on the things primarily that matter to God. Tonight, we have a fictional character, but he's such a relatable character that he's very real to us. The rich farmer is like many today. And and I think we're going to, to like the story because it's a standard story. It's a picture of what could be an everyday person, a fictional man as a picture of a very real man. He's not a wax dummy in some museum. He is walking the streets around us every day. It's not only a standard story, but in one sense, it's a successful story. This rich farmer, he is a successful man. You know, no one wants to hear the story of a failure, you know. But but that story of a success... You know, people want to hear that. People tune into that. We're, we're excited to know who wins the big prize. And they lived happily ever after. You know, I, I'm more of a basketball fan, so I don't even watch football. But, but I'll admit that we had service on Super Bowl Sunday night, and I stayed around here a long time. But I got home, and I... I Just had to find out who won. I didn't even know who was in it two days before. But you had to to find out the success story and who came out on top. And so there's some success in this story. But this is a shocking story as well. Because the Lord God calls this man a fool. I mean, that's a stinging word. That's like the big enchilada. 
when you want to get somebody. You, you shouldn't call anybody that, but, but that's, that's the big one. When you, when, when you want to call somebody something and, and really get their attention, uh, who wants to be called that? It's a shocking story. It's harsh, and no one likes to be called that. Yet, the Lord calls this successful farmer, in one sense, and in a couple of uh, ways, he's successful, and the Lord calls him a fool. Why, why does the Lord call this rich farmer a fool? You know, he didn't get it from the farmer himself. He's, he's pretty high on himself. You know, he thinks he's done a whole lot and he established something good and that has come from himself. And, and so I doubt he would call himself that. I'm sure the rich farmer had neighbors. And I doubt his neighbors would call him that. I mean, a very successful farmer, and, and he, he works hard, he has everything, you know, just like he wants it, and he's a good businessman with his, with his farming and what he does. I doubt his neighbor called him that. His neighbor probably looked up to him for that, you know, that, so it wouldn't be his neighbor. It wouldn't be personal with the Lord. Because the Lord's just not like that. He sure wouldn't be jealous or envious of this rich farmer. So, so it's not personal with him. But we're going to see throughout this message the reason. The reason that the Lord calls this man a fool. And why this man is a fool. A, a couple of little things here. The name is fitting for him. I mean, the Lord calls him that. So, so that tells me right there that this is a perfect fitting name for this man, unfortunately. You know, it's better that the Lord called him something rather than what we would evaluate him and call him. We might look up to him. We, you know, the Lord's ways and his thoughts are far above our ways and our thoughts. And he, and he might just ha- have an, an outward uh, deception about him and, and he just fools us hook, line, and sinker and we think he's great so we, we, might, we might call him amazing but it's fitting that he's a fool because that's what the Lord calls him why is this man a fool? think about this rich farmer it's not because of his success that he is a fool I mean, there is nothing at all wrong with the success that this farmer has had. He's not a fool because of his substance. Being rich does not make this man a fool. The Bible is never negative on the wealthy because of their wealth. The potential danger of riches is recognized... In the Bible, the temptations that come with riches are are made known, but the Bible does not condemn this man because of the substance that he has. You know, wealth can be bad, but it can be good as well. You know, it's, it's a force. And it's used for good or bad, uh, depending on the hand that it's in and the guidance that one has uh, of the hand that the wealth is in. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad. It can be used for bad if it's only used for self. It can be used for bad, unfortunately, to sway things in justice, you know, to, to override our constitution to stain the, the very flag that we salute in this country. Uh, you know, it's used to oppress others, it can be. But, but hey, wealth is used for good as well. It's used to clothe and to feed those who are in need. It can be used to construct a building for the worship of God. To, to repair the building for the worship of God. To improve the house of God. Wealth is used to provide missionaries with having their needs met so they can go and evangelize the country or the place that God has called them to. This man is not a fool because he has wealth. 
Though it can be used for bad, it can be used for things that, to assist in great things for the glory of God. God uses it. So this man is not a fool because of his substance. This man is not a fool because of his system. As in what he does. He didn't shim-sham people to be able to get what he had. Nothing about this makes this man out to be dishonest in his occupation. You know, there's a way of getting money that'll make it a curse to us. But there's a way of getting money that will make it a blessing to us as well. The way this man gained his wealth was in such a way that that there was no curse that you could see that would be involved in it. He wasn't operating a beer joint. You know, he wasn't running a casino. He wasn't... uh, doing his laborers in the field wrong that we would read. He was taking care of them and paying them well for for all we can see here. He didn't mistreat the orphan. He didn't rob the widow. He actually earned his substance. The abundance he had, it came about in a very upright and honest way. He did it by farming. Verse 16 says, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. I I tell you, I don't know about you, but there's just something about farming and gardening. It's just such a pure, wholesome thing to me, the way I look at it. I'll never forget going up to East Texas and my Uncle Doc had a, had a garden about half the size of this sanctuary. Man, I got in trouble for running down the rows of his garden because he wasn't just meticulous about, you know, what it produced. He had a pretty garden. I couldn't even run down the row of corn stalks without him seeing me. But, you know, and I wasn't putting all this together as a kid But I think back now, and there was just something that was of a goodness to to watch my Uncle Doc gardening out there and to try to teach me as a little kid to do that. You know, he in the 80s, he lived on a pension of about $300 a month, and he had more food than any house that I would go to of any relative or any friend or even my own a lot of the time. There were, there's just something so wholesome about it. This man was a farmer. This man was definitely not a fool because of his system for getting wealth. I mean, everything he earned was honest. He was a hard worker, obviously. He had a very successful farming. This man was not a fool Because of his savings. You might say, Brother Kenneth, you might might want to go back and read this parable again. No, this man was not a fool because of his savings. Look, he, he didn't blow his earnings and waste it. You know, that that's something that is that is foolish to do. The prodigal son, he wasted his substance. He took his earnings, and he went off, and he spent them on this and that, and he had absolutely nothing to show for it. He completely wasted it. You know, I've just come to think that Jesus doesn't like waste. I think about when he fed the multitude. And after he fed the multitude, he told his disciples... Go out there and gather all those fragments. You know, the fish and the bread, everything I laid out among the the whole group of people. It probably didn't look like much. Most people probably walk over there full and and just a little bit here and there, they probably walk away from it. Jesus gave his disciples a job. Go gather that stuff up. And they went and gathered it up and there were 12 baskets of food. First time I ever read that, I thought, Jesus, 
He doesn't like waste. He, de he doesn't like to waste anything. This farmer was responsible with what he had. He didn't waste it. His savings did not make him the fool that the Lord called him. This man was a fool because of his substituting. He substituted his riches in place of God. He substituted himself in place of God. He didn't talk to God. He didn't talk to God about spiritual riches. He talked to himself about his earthly riches. The, everything that he possessed from his crop in abundance, he consulted with himself on what he should do with this. Verse 17 says, He thought within himself. Man, I, I can't help but believe that this rich farmer, he looks good on the outside. I'm not talking about his looks. I'm talking about a guy that, man, he just seems like the appearance of everything, of what he has in him, as in this man has it together. This man has it going on. He crosses his T's. He dots his I's. He knows what he's doing. You know, don't judge that book by the cover too soon. He looks like an upright man. And through and through to most he would. But we get to read his thoughts here. Now we can't do that just in general with people. But here... We get to read this man's thoughts. And as I read this, man, did I ever read the pronouns. Verse 17. What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I will say to my soul, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Someone said, there's no I in team. And somebody else said, no, there isn't, but there's an M.E., you know, and, and I think we credit someone in recent years to coming up with that. That might have been the rich farmer that came up with that one. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. When this man thought, here's his problem. Here's why he's a fool. When he thought, he had no thought of God. As we read his thoughts, we would have to say that in his thinking, it's as though God did not exist. And this is foolishness. That he looked to himself for answers. Wow. Wow. He turned his situation over and over in his mind. And there was not one idea about the creator who gave him life. Or the one who is responsible for the supply that he has. This is foolish. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. He was contemplating what to do with his abundance. And it didn't cross his mind to ask the one who gave it to him. To ask the one who has it all. So he figured up something within himself, in his own mind, without the Lord. The man who does his reckoning without God is foolish. Anyone who reckons without God needs to take a course 
and divine ownership. To this farmer, ownership and possession mean the same thing. You know, put something in someone's hands as a possession and they lose all discernment between possession and ownership. He thinks because he possesses the farm that he owns the farm. You and I have things placed in our possession. We possess some things. But God owns it all. The 24th Psalm and the first verse says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Man, that's one of those straitjacket verses. Uh, no wiggle room whatsoever. Everyone and everything, everywhere belongs to God. It is all His. Well, we've taken a look at what is wrong with this man. We've been pretty hard on him. We've taken a look at him, where he has failed, the wrong turn he has made, why he is a fool. He consulted with himself and he decided to tear down his barns with all of this abundance he has and to build bigger barns and to take back, to kick back and take it easy and eat, drink, and be merry. When all of this contemplating was going on within himself, that he was doing within himself, it was that very night that his soul was required of him, and what he had went on to someone else that may have been wasted. But he did all of that contemplating and all of that thinking. He took a wrong turn. He made wrong decisions. He thought within himself. The Lord says, he's a fool. How can we make sure tonight that we don't take his wrong turn and that we get it right and continually get it right? Well, instead of foolishness, we need to live by faith. Instead of de depending upon ourselves, we depend upon the Lord. It's with faith. You know, faith is going to immediately change the vocabulary. Faith would immediately change the way this farmer spoke. It would go from I, me, my, and mine to him, his, yours, and ours. It would bring God's word to mind, faith would when we're tempted to make our own decisions, and it comes to mind that ye are not your own, ye are bought with a price. It'll come to mind that, hey, hold on, we're dead, and the one who gave it all to us is alive, I believe we'll go to him. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're dead in Christ, and, and we live in him. And, and so, by faith, we know that we are his, and all that we have is his. And we possess, but we don't own anything. And we trust Him with these things. We can get it right tonight with faith that God is the owner. He's the owner of all. He's given us everything we have. But not only with faith can we give it right, get it right, but we can get it right with thanks. This rich farmer had no faith, so he had no gratitude for anyone but himself. I mean, he broke his arm, patting himself on the back. He thought he did it. He could only be thankful to himself. He couldn't be thankful to anyone else. He forgot God. So he thanked himself. 
The psalmist says in the 103rd Psalm, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. This rich farmer, he forgot God. He didn't bless God. He didn't think about God. He forgot Him. But when we give the credit to God by faith, then flowing with that is going to be giving God thanks. We get this right, not only with faith, and not only with thanks, but with action. The farmer sensed no obligation to take any action concerning all he had because he thought he gave it to himself, so he just kicked back to be lazy and to eat, drink, and be merry. That was life to him. That's what he was going to do. He, had his, he got his stuff in storage, and then he kicked his feet up to take it easy. You know, let's compare that to the Apostle Paul who was saved by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and then he obligated himself to preach the gospel so that others could be saved by the power of the gospel that saved him. He saw himself as indebted to another. And we will delightfully obligate ourselves to action that glorifies God for all the giving that He has done. It, It is so healthy. It is so spiritually healthy for you and I to thank God for what we have. We may suffer a little loss, but we can thank God for what we have. We can thank God for all that we have because it came from Him. And we ought to praise Him for that all the time. And glorify Him for our lives and for the possessions that He has given us that He is owner of. We get this right with action. We not only get this right with action, we get this right with trust. This man had had much. And he trusted in money, we'd say. And he trusted in his material things. We will have these type of things in our possession. And they can be good. They can be used for good. We're just not to trust those things. He, this rich man, he trusted in what he had temporarily in this life. Don't trust in the things that we have. Trust in the Lord and trust in the owner of it all, the Lord God. How do we get this right? Well, with preparation also. With preparation, this rich farmer prepared to satisfy his soul with all that he had in this life. He looked to satisfy himself in this life. The future that he looked ahead at was in this life, not the one to come. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with thinking about retirement and thinking about how much breakfast, lunch, and dinner are going to cost every day and getting all of those things in order and making sense for retirement. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But there is such a greater and more important future for us to have preparations for. In Colossians chapter 3, it says, Set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. Jesus says... Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Let's go right where this man went wrong. Christian, let's let's make our, our number one focus laying up treasures in heaven. Let's, let's make that our preparation for the future. You know, we, we've had that glorious day of our preparation for the future, 
by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And He would have us to serve Him and let Him lay up things for us in heaven for eternity. But I also ask anyone listening tonight that may be unprepared. You are not prepared for eternity. Religion has put you in some kind of suitcase, but it's not going on a flight to heaven. The preparation for eternity is not in all the confusion of religion. The preparation for eternity is trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You personally, by faith that only you know about, that's going on between you and God, you personally trust in Jesus Christ and let Him give you a home in heaven. That's the only thing that gives you peace with God. Salvation is the only thing that gives you peace. Salvation is the only thing that will say within you, I know that I am prepared for the future. I know I am prepared in Jesus Christ alone. Is there one here tonight who would prepare for eternity by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ? We, we pray you do that tonight before you leave. There's, there's nothing about me that allows me to save you. I don't need to. There's no room for that. There's no need for that because Jesus saves. But I can show you how right here in His Word, religion-free, just what the Bible says so that you can come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. What matters? What matters in this life if eternity is not prepared in your heart? Well... The rich farmer went off the wrong way. Let us go, let us go the right way by faith, by knowing the one who has given us all that we have and and we're going to trust him. And we're going to consult with him. And we're going to be led by him and all of his wisdom who knows all, who owns all, who has given all to us that we have. This subject may change on any given Wednesday night, but for now, uh, I, I pray you're getting things out of this because I've never taught a study uh, of this fashion before, and uh, I'm just enjoying another angle of, of looking at some of these messages I've preached in other ways and pray that God is using it for you in some way. I told a young lady I'm going to give you a praise report tonight before we leave. And, and that is Carson's little sister, Charlotte. I hate to, in one way, I hate to refer to them as the bus rider kids, but that's how everybody is easily able to identify them. And Charlotte trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of her life tonight. Amen. So if you see Carson's little sister, encourage her and tell, you, tell her how happy you are for her. And I tell you what, she... She not only believed on the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, she, she knows what baptism is and she's ready to be baptized.